Welcome everybody back to my new channel, the Radix Report. Um, on this channel, I'm doing sort of a certain certain topics basically that um, you know, would be different from my normal channel and the kinds of stuff I post there. The video I want to do today is called the Coming Neo Feudal Age, and um, this is looking at the current economic situation, but also going back to a video. Um, by Professor Sam Bachnin from uh, April of 2020. That video is entitled Pandemic Slaves and Their Neo-Feudal Lords, Envy-Fueled Global Insurrection. And what he says uh, basically in this video is that envy, uncertainty, and rage globalized will lead to social unrest. He says the pandemic spells the end of entrepreneurship, small to medium businesses, and self-employment. And it's transitioning to the rise of like the gig economy or the temporary contractor. He says it also catalyzes the shift from the real economy to the trading in expectations. And he made a number of predictions in that video in 2020 saying this is what he thinks will happen after the pandemic that I think uh, have held out, up pretty well and I want to highlight. And we're going to just play a couple clips from that. We're not going to play all of it because it's an hour and 30 minute long video, but I will have the links to everything in the video description. And I hope you guys check it out and watch the full thing because I think he makes some very good points. So. Before we get into what he said, he saw coming right after the pandemic. First, I want to look at a couple of the latest um, pieces here on the economy. The strangest recession in our lifetimes. This comes from the Epic Times. Evidence of economic weaknesses and decline fill headlines day by day with major banks reporting lower earnings, big box stores with excessive inventories, home sales skidding, and consumer sentiment crashing. Meanwhile, inflation in all sectors is raging so high and hot that it has overtaken every other issue that polls say matter in the lives of average Americans. And it's funny because it goes to show you how sort of out of touch um, the media class is and um, the political class. They are running around trying to redefine what a recession is so they can proclaim that we're not in one as if we we're unable to see the reality around us. It's this sort of um, attempting to infantilize people that, and bring them into a state of regression. If you can regress people enough to a childlike state, you can get them to believe in magical thinking. Uh, we see this everywhere now, and actually, this should be a separate video. I'm going to talk about the rise of narcissism and magical thinking and, you know, con artists taking advantage of that. And it's not, you know, just the kinds of people you think. Everybody, I think, is susceptible in some ways to some forms of magical thinking. And, and to bring it into this video, talking about the pandemic... Well, the idea that you can put a mask on your face and somehow be protected is magical thinking. The idea that if you get a magical shot in your arm, you can escape death. This is magical thinking. If you just do what you're told and follow um, these strict rules and procedures, everything will be fine and you'll be okay and you'll be safe. It's having this parental figure and you going back into this regressive state so you don't actually have to think for yourself or have responsibility for anything. If you just follow the guidelines, right, the social distancing, and you comply, then everything will be fine and everybody will be safe. This is infantilized magical thinking. It is wishful thinking and it does not comport to reality. While at the same time, these very people... Uh, proclaim that they believe in science uh, as if science is settled or something like that. They put their faith in an expert class that they see as a priest class, you know, as if these people are not fallible or don't have their own biases or incentives to say certain things. And it's the same thing with putting trust in the government as a, a parental figure, an all-knowing uh, authoritative 
figure that can just, if you just follow what they say, everything will be fine. It's this removal of self-responsibility where you can just put this on to uh, everybody else. If something happens, it's not your fault. You did what you were told. You were a little good boy or a little good girl. Uh, it's it's silly and it is very sad. So um, <laughs> that should be a separate video just talking about and explaining really what magical thinking is and why I think a lot of people have it. And, you know, you can look at like uh, divorce rates and how that has skyrocketed in America and things like childhood trauma. You know, a lot of people, myself included, had very traumatic childhoods and you had to engage in some sort of magical thinking in order to survive. You know, escapism is part of that. Uh, personally, I would retreat into my books, you know, and I could read about people who had normal, insane lives and imagine that, you know, one day someone would come and save me. Um, and that's okay when you're a child, you know, it's how you survive an uncertain, chaotic life. When you become an adult, though, well, really, when you become an adolescent and you start to understand your brain starts to develop critical thinking, uh, you understand now like that this that was magical thinking, you know, you and part of that is also thinking that you're the cause of, you know, your abusive parents, emotional instability, like, oh, I did I caused, you know, her to fly into a drunken rage and beat me because I wasn't good or something like that. That kind of like, that is magical thinking, believing that you're the cause of somebody else's internal emotional state or that you can control that. And if you, if you were just good, somehow magically, they won't abuse you. It's like silliness. But it, that's what a child believes, you know, they don't know better, their brains are not fully developed. So with the modern age and propaganda coming from governments and media infantilizing people, uh, it's all done on purpose and it is to bring people back into a regressive childhood state, um, into a state of sort of like learned helplessness as well, where they are engaging in this sort of magical thinking and just following the rules, doing what they're told, as if they're a child again. Because then you're really easy to control. Children are very easy to control and manipulate. The article continues. This inflationary recession, also called stagflation, is an odd beast in any case. The combination of both purchasing power declines and falling productivity violates not only every modeling presumption made since the Keynesian revolution of the 1930s, but also just plain intuition. Higher prices are supposed to signal higher demand and or tighter supply, not lower demand and higher supply. Yeah, it is sort of contradictory to what we normally understand. So this is strange. We're going to have to get used to it. It's what happens when the money itself loses its integrity. The whole point of money in the first place, the essence of its economic utility, is to provide a common tool of measurement to facilitate trade and enable accounting. Its emergence permits investors, producers, and capital owners to assess the economic rationality of their actions. When money blows up and no longer serves as a reliable guide to economic realities, various degrees of chaos ensue. You can feel like you're getting richer when you are really getting poorer. What can seem like profits are really losses. What seems like a hopeful environment can quickly switch to the other direction and become despair. That's why inflation induces such fear in every sector of life. Yes, exactly. Uh, we learned this in the 1970s as stagflation gradually took over in successive ways until it was stopped in 1981 by two major shifts, tighter money and a policy emphasis on strong economic growth. Today, we're getting the former but not the latter, virtually guaranteeing a serious quagmire that will last at least two more years. The economic damage of this period will be too enormous to contemplate, and I want people to understand that 
This is not going to be limited to us here in America. It is a global problem. And part of that is due to globalization and the interconnectivity now uh, and enmeshment of countries with other countries and everything tied together. That means if there's a problem in China, right, we feel that and it affects us. That is a problem. We no longer manufacture our own goods. We import that from China and other countries. Uh, we have interconnected supply chains. So we rely on this sort of global trade um, because everything has now been outsourced and greedy corporations did that because they wanted everything to be cheaper. It was all about the bottom line. They stopped caring about the employee um, they stopped caring about their country and employing their own countrymen. And, and it was all about simply money, the bottom line. And now that is coming, I think, to bite people in the butt. And I think that it, we are really seeing this sort of failure of this post-World War II neoliberal order. Now, you could also argue that this is being done by design. Every time it seems like one of these economic crises or crashes occur, what ends up happening? The rich always get richer and the poor and middle class become decimated. It is always a massive transfer of wealth. And this, of course, is not surprising. It is how the system is designed. Let's take a careful look at the strangest anomaly of all, the unemployment rate. It's hist historically low right now at 3.6%, which is far lower than it has ever been during any impending recession. In fact, it's as low as any period since the end of World War II. And I would uh, say if it is to be believed, if we're supposed to believe those figures are correct, and yet everyone knows that this isn't a reason for hope. The labor participation rate is about where it was 40 years ago, as if the whole experience of a more inclusive workforce never happened. It's also currently falling. There are reasons, both demographic and cultural, for this, but it's impossible to understand without reference to the egregious and devastating effects of lockdowns. Yeah, that, in my opinion, was on purpose. In other words, the official unemployment rate measures only those who are currently looking for work. It does not count those who have already been phased out of the workforce or uh, people who aren't looking for work or who haven't figured out how to pay bills by working unefficiently, uh, unofficially under the table. That makes sense in a way. Why count people who aren't even looking for work as part of the unemployed masses? On the other hand, it's a case of how a statistically accurate number can create a seriously misleading picture. Exactly. By any standard, this measure of economic health is broken. Every recession on record in the 20th century has been marked by high unemployment. This pattern has been so strong, it has confused even smart economists, many of whom believe that the labor problem was itself a cause rather than an effect of the recession. They often sought to solve this issue through benefits and job creation programs, policy tricks that have literally never worked, ever. That today, that no longer works, but it points to a larger problem. Most of the data sets are overly uh, aggregated. The big number treats all workers as a whole without regard to demographics. The Department of Labor tries to break it down by categories, but not in ways that are helpful. We can find out all kinds of things about race and gender, but not much about the issue that really terrifies people. Which income groups are the most vulnerable to job insecurity today. Exactly. Only about 20% of U.S. workers are able to earn more than 100000 per year, but these are the target jobs that every single college graduate wants. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's why they go into a massive debt through st student loans. Ironically, this is because everyone knows that these are the jobs that require the least work and offer the most benefits. They are the Zoom jobs that everyone wanted to have during lockdowns because it meant getting up late, wearing your pajamas all day, and starting cocktail hour at mid-afternoon. 
But my friends, beware. Everything we see among current economic trends suggests that these jobs, more than any other, are vulnerable to being slaughtered in tight economic times. Yes, because they are redundant. This would be the opposite of the 2008 recession. Back then, unemployment peaked at 10%, but a more careful look at the numbers showed something incredible. This affected the high incomes not at all. Their rate of unemployment never went above 3.2%. A breakdown of the data revealed that the unemployment of that period back in 2008 hit mostly the working class's earning wages, while leaving the upper incomes untouched. The disparity of economic suffering was the single most salient feature of that period. If you remember Occupy Wall Street, people were walking around with signs, you know, saying eat the rich and, you know, we're the 99%. The this time we face something completely different. There is a huge shortage of workers willing to earn relatively lower income, show up to the office, earn wages, and actually work with their hands, drive trucks, move the boxes, and make the food. There is, on the other hand, a surplus of workers demanding huge salaries to stare at screens, stay home, gossip on Slack, and otherwise deploy their generous benefit packages to the maximum extent. Exactly. This recession will very likely be felt in the labor market severely, but the effects won't be felt among those who are willing to do actual work versus earn high incomes by virtue of their college credentials, my degree. The people who are in for a rude awakening are those who have heretofore imagined their CVs alone would guarantee a good life. And this is absolutely true. And I will say you did see some of this back in uh, 2008 to 2010, I remember when I was working as a, um, a paralegal back then, I was, you know, very young. And I remember having friends who had just graduated college with four year degrees, and they were getting jobs at like Starbucks, you know, and they kind of were asking me, well, how did you, how did you get your job? You don't even have a degree. And I said, yeah, I just learned on the job. I started out as a receptionist, I asked, you know, people if they needed help and I learned how to do paralegal work. That's what normal people do. So, and I didn't have any student loans to pay back. I wasn't in debt and having to work at a Starbucks or, you know, a restaurant or something like that with a four-year college degree and something useless like liberal arts. So I think that, you know, that's a going to be a, main, a major problem for these folks. Moving on, uh, this is from John Hassan. Biden promised no tax hikes if you make less than $400,000 per year. The Inflation Reduction Act raises taxes for everyone making over $30,000 a year. By the way, this is considered poverty. If you make $30,000 a year or, uh, you know, that's considered to be like, like you're in poverty, um, okay, so Biden promises no new taxes on anyone making less than 400000 Experts doubt he can keep that pledge. Well, this is the same person who said, you know, oh, yeah, we're going to have student loan forgiveness, and dummies believed him. Uh, why on earth would you believe that? Just something I wanted to include. Um, this has nothing to do with the economy, but in a way, it has a lot to do with what we're talking about. Just looking at how I feel like we've become a different species through processed food, through technology, through decadence, and, um, you know, having these jobs like we just talked about where you're sitting around on your butt all day. This is high school in 1962. No internet, no seed oils, no processed foods. Doesn't this look like a different species? There's no obesity. Look at uh, the lack of obesity. Look at how fit everybody is. The men actually look like men. They don't look soft and like soyed out like the uh, soy society we have today. It, looking at this is actually heartbreaking. And I think that we can see that we are in a sick society now just looking at how only in the 1960s, how different things were. Not look at them. You can see all these men, not one obese soy boy with breasts. And the men were actually men. They weren't interested in pretending to be women. The women were women. They weren't trying to be men. Um, and this is, it, it, ex it explains a lot, folks. I'll just leave it at that. Um, 
here, uh, Wall Street Silver says, Argentina is collapsing again. People are refusing to work as the government runs out of money and cuts subsidy programs for food and fuel. 43% unemployment, inflation over 60%. Quote, half of our country doesn't want a job. And the ones that do don't want to pay the taxes for the others, right? To sit around and do nothing because it's redistributing wealth. Okay, these progressive progressive taxing and progressive um, wealth redistribution is a problem because eventually people start to realize that they are working hard for other people to sit around and do nothing. And then you end up with everything collapsing. And that should not be surprising to anybody. Um, Jim Bianco, uh, Bianco here says the supply chain backlog is still bad. A new record number of container ships are uh, waiting to unload off the coast of U.S. ports. And so this is from FreightWave's record container ship traffic jam as backlog continues to build. You see all these container ships with goods just sitting off of their uh, off of the ports just waiting to be unloaded. Why is this happening again? So this is supply chain problems, you know, as we talked about. The U.S. and Canada's ports rank dead last in efficiency. Angola and the Congo, the Congo, rank ahead of the United States. What? This is... I don't know how do you how do you explain this? Is that on purpose at this point? Is this being done by design? Or can it really just be that incompetent? The Congo <laughs> ranks ahead of the United States of port efficiency. Is it the lazy pe This is the other question I have. Is it lazy people who simply don't want to do their job? And then he says the U.S. supply chain is so brittle it cannot adapt to a changing post-COVID economy. And we're going to get to that in a minute. This friction is going to keep inflation elevated until money is spent to restructure it. It is not going to fix itself with time. This is absolutely correct. And we're going to talk about the post-COVID economy when we get to Professor Bachman's video uh, because he was right. Um, just to point some stuff out there, why are Wall Street's inflation forecasts hell-bent on a 2% target? Quote, everybody is of the belief that inflation is permanently not a problem, unquote. Oh yeah, as if Wall Street's never been wrong before, but what if we entered a new post-COVID economy with permanently higher inflation? And this is what we want to start talking about. Um, will the recession become official? Yeah, because they're trying to pretend that it's not. Um, but that's not, again, magical thinking isn't reality. And Thomas Massey, uh, Representative Massey says, Bastiat on the COVID stimulus, quote, to rob the public, it is necessary to deceive them. To deceive them, it is necessary to persuade them that they are robbed for their own advantage and to induce them to accept in exchange for their property, imaginary services, and often worse, unquote. And he says, I said the same thing when it passed, and this is a quote of his from March of 2020. The stimulus package that just passed is the biggest wealth transfer from common folks to the super rich, Wall Street and the bankers, in the history of mankind, done in the name of a virus with a $1,200 check as the cheese in the trap. This will be obvious in short order, and that is what we're going to talk about now in the video, which I have titled The Coming Neo-Feudal Age. That is exactly what it was, and it was the, the lockdowns that contributed to the shutting down of mom-and-pop shops, right, of small businesses, while places like Amazon were allowed to prosper, and they were allowed to be running, but... They put restrictions on small businesses. And there were many people who had a small business that had been in their family for something like three generations, and they lost that during the, the lockdowns. And it was not necessary. It wasn't. And uh, Mr. Vaknin is going to explain here that actually they did a study looking at where 
that stimulus money went to, right? And as usual, it went to the wealthy. Cheers. <laughs> Okay, so he, he begins his video drinking some wine. You gotta love it. Merlot, very good grape. BC and AD, before Corona and after distancing. My name is Steel Sandaknin, and I would forever be the author of Malignant Self Love Narcissism Revisited. And today we're going to discuss. A certain aspect of the pandemic it's economics okay so this is i think really important and and try to remember that he made this video in april of 2020 so this was right at the beginning and uh this i think at the time was something that a lot of people were not really paying attention to you know there were very few of us who saw this for what it was as this massive transfer of wealth because people get caught up in the the propaganda and they lose sight of that the bigger picture right and how this economics fits into the rising tide of narcissism worldwide and how narcissism brought about in an obscure indirect way both the pandemic and its economic consequences that's a really good point the rise of narcissism i mean could, was there anything more um obvious of the of communal narcissism than the nurses of tiktok <laughs> you know do you guys remember those videos the the dancing nurses of tiktok was there any greater display of narcissism and communal narcissism than freaking nurses of tiktok and people like you know just screaming at people for not complying you know, to a T, right? Like, oh my God, you're you're the reason that your grandparents are gonna die and stuff like that, which is just ludicrous. But yeah, I think he's right to hone in on this like narcissistic aspect of what that was. So stay tuned. It's gonna be a bumpy ride. The pandemic constitutes amounts to a ginormous transfer of wealth from the poor to the rich. Okay, right off the bat, he calls it out for exactly what it is. And that's why we have to give respect to Professor Vaknin here, who, by the way, if you um, if you're not subscribed to his channel, I highly recommend that you do. He does really good work. Um, he also has done a, a number of stuff with Richard Grannon, who I have interviewed uh, in the past um, and who I think is just fabulous. So I, I recommend both of those channels uh, as some some people to follow if you're interested in psychology uh, and stuff like that, but also just commentary, like common sense things, guys. Yes, you heard me correctly. A wealth transfer from the poor to the rich. Consider asset prices, real estate, stocks, bonds. That's where rich people's money is, in these assets. And they, mysteriously, are very stable. The rich get to keep the wages and the benefits that they would have normally paid out to their poorer compatriots. This money stays in rich pockets. Moreover, most tax revenues and government stimulus funds, bailout funds, the 2.2 trillion plus half a trillion, almost $3 trillion, studies show that anywhere between 90 and 95%, that's 90 to 95 percent end up with big corporations and the already affluent oh is that surprising at all um no it, it shouldn't be surprising and i think as mr massey pointed out that that those little checks the 1200 hundred dollar check that was the the little carrot they were dangling on a stick while they're leading you off the ledge of a, a bridge you know <laughs> They're leading us all down the, the path of destruction with this little carrot on a stick of here's your little stimulus check. Um, and this, you know, people have talked, they were during the pandemic talking about UBI, universal basic income. Again, that is simply the little crumbs that they're throwing to you while trying to get you to take the poison pill 
right? And so what he was is saying is that studies have showed none of that money went to real people, the common people, none of it. And none of it went to small businesses. No small businesses got bailed out. It all went to the uh, oligarchs who run our country and their friends and families and multinational corporations, as he said, the already affluent. Income inequality, already unprecedented in history, will skyrocket. The pandemic will also bring about the death of entrepreneurship. entrepreneurship. Yeah, he's right. It will bring about the death of entrepreneurship because the there, this has been a consolidation of wealth and power. Entrepreneurship was the poor, poor man's way out of poverty. It was the main transmission mechanism of social upward mobility moving from one socioeconomic stratum in which you were born to a higher socioeconomic stratum. Social mobility is all but dead in the United States, has been since the 1980s. He's absolutely correct. Yes. Um, everything he's saying here is right. And I think it's fascinating looking at this in 2022 and being like, yeah, here's one person who saw exactly like what was happening for what it was, you know? Together with wage stagnation, wages haven't grown in well over four decades. Right. Your children will earn less than you did. That's the first time again in history. So yeah, it's crazy. You know, we were told about the American dream, and this is when you have to start questioning a lot of things that have happened since the 1960s, maybe even before, but specifically things like the Hart Seller Act. If employment and entrepreneurship are decimated by the pandemic. After the pandemic, people would be risk-averse. Entrepreneurship is very risky. Self-employment is a gamble on yourself. It's a risk. People will be risk-averse. The financing of entrepreneurship and self-employment will dry up. There'll be no money in the system. It will be demonetized. Well, that's a really good point because in order to start a business, like he said, starting a business is risky. We know that most new businesses fail. I think it's something like um, maybe two out of five new businesses actually succeed. Most of them do not. Uh, most new businesses fail. And even if they do succeed, it takes a number of years before they actually turn a profit, right? So during that time, a lot of these people are relying on loans and uh, lines of credit. And that is going to dry up because lenders are no longer going to be willing to take that risk because of the tighter financial situation. They are not going to be giving to uh, new businesses, new people, entrepreneurs, they're not going to be lending to them because it's going to be, they're going to be looking for safe things to put money into. It will be bled dry. And above all, big business will take over dying small businesses. Oh yeah, mergers and acquisitions. <laughs> It, it, it's right. Big businesses will buy up smaller businesses. They'll put their competitors out of business when people are vulnerable, um, you know, in a in a recession and with high inflation, people are really vulnerable right now. That's when the vultures come in and they start preying on people. You know, we're going to buy up your business and many people will be forced to sell because they don't have any other options. They can't afford to keep going. And so big businesses are going to get bigger. The wealthy are going to get more wealth and the powerful will become more powerful because they're consolidating that wealth and power at the expense of regular people who are now going to be phased out of the marketplace altogether. There will be a process of consolidation, like the famous movie, Big, Bigger, Biggest. In the future, the majority, the bulk of the private sector will have evaporated. And the scene, the landscape, will be dominated by two or three major actors, duopolis, um, in every sector. And a really good point, I think, to make here at what he and what he's saying is correct. I mean, we can just look at go back to the 1980s. There were something like 40 major banks. There's now four, four. They've been consolidated that much, um, which is insane. And nothing was done to stop 
the monopolistic practices that was going on there. I mean, and this is why I say when people try to claim that, that there's a free market or something, there absolutely isn't. We do not have that in America. And even Professor Bachman will say in this video that America is Marxist now. It's socialist and it has been for a while. And he's absolutely right. They are picking and choosing winners and losers. They're deciding who gets to succeed and who doesn't, who they're going to apply the laws to, antitrust laws, um, and who they're not going to apply it to. They are allowing, like we have, people will say, well, how come nothing was done about these um, monopolies to rein them in? Don't we have some kind of laws on the books for this? Yes, we have laws, but if they're not enforced, they don't matter. We have antitrust laws, but they are not enforced. I mean, we heard for a long time under the Trump administration that Google, Facebook, all the big tech companies were going to be investigated for uh, antitrust violations. We heard about attorneys general in all 40 and in, in all 50 states, excuse me, uh, investigating Google for antitrust and what came of that? Absolutely nothing. Nothing. These mega actors who take over smaller actors. Consider, for example, Amazon. It's likely to take over the majority of bookstores, uh, independent bookstores. Yeah, Amazon is already putting these bookstores out of business. He's correct, and they're overtaking it. Yes, so these smaller mom-and-pop shops, they're not going to exist anymore. You're going to have a conglomerate like Amazon, an international conglomerate, that is uh, horrible, right? Horrible customer service. Um, it, it's just awful, like lowest common denominator stuff. That's what you're going to have. You're going to have these massive, massive companies, and they're not going to treat their workers right. They won't pay them a good wage. I mean, we interviewed Chris Smalls on, on the other channel, um, and we talked about how Amazon prevented them from unionizing. The employees and the length that they went to in order to do that to shut that down from spying on people surveilling them following them after work um intimidation uh things like that even bezos himself was in a meeting and they brought up mr small's name because he had been trying to unionize so bezos himself was aware of this and was like shut it down you know and that's how it's gonna be you are going to be treated basically like a slave. It's going to be, like he says uh, in his video here, neo-feudalism. Throughout the, uh, the world, not only in the United States. And so, how will people survive? They would enter, they will enter the gig economy. They will become temp contractors, temporary contractors. They will drive Uber vehicles. They will rent out their apartments or rooms in their apartments via Airbnb, the gig economy. They will do temp jobs. And the vast majority of people, probably 99%, will have to work two or three jobs in two or three shifts just to make ends meet, and they will fail. And they will fail. Exactly. They're not going to survive. Like, that's the point. How will people survive this? It's not not very well, like probably not. They probably won't. And most people are not prepared for what is coming. They don't have any savings. Americans are living paycheck to paycheck. Americans have massive credit card debt. Um, it, I don't see this um, going in a good direction, we'll just say. And they will sink deeper into debt. Yeah. Their savings have been exhausted by the pandemic. So this is... The dismal dystopian future awaiting all of us, economically speaking. But let's delve now a bit deeper into the phil philosophy behind all these trends, what brought them about, how are they all interconnected, and how, how actually they all started long before the pandemic. The pandemic was a catalyst, like an enzyme, in whose presence processes become much faster. So the pandemic just kind of fast, was a fast forward in a very old VCR. <laughs> so what he's saying is that, they look, they have been moving us in this direction. This was just a way to accelerate the transfer of wealth and into their hands. This is a process that has been going on for a long time, though. 
Let's start with money. The more money we make, the less we appreciate its relative, respective, and proportional value to other people. With very few exceptions, rich people, no matter how stingy, seem to lose touch with the pecuniary reality of the 99% of the population who are poor or poorer. Indeed, to the wealthy, money is not a store of value. I repeat, to the wealthy, to the super-rich, money is not a store of value. It is a token which allows them to participate in economic and non-economic games. It's not a big game to them. I call this process of desensitization to the value of money personal inflation. Why? Because precisely like classic macroeconomic inflation, as far as these affluent people are concerned, it thwarts the price signal. It destroys the price signal embedded and inherent in money. It distorts the efficient allocation of economic resources. If you don't value money, you just throw it around or you keep it in the bank and you do nothing with it. This is a really good point that he's making. And he is making a point. Um, I think that he could have a very drawn out way of explaining something that could be said in more simplistic terms. But he he's given you a lot of information here that is valuable. And he makes a very good point about how the wealthy have sort of lost touch with the value of their money. So they they either throw it around on nonsense and they don't mind wasting it on things that never come to fruition if they have some kind of, you know, impulse, right? at the On the drop of a hat or something like that, of something that interests them but isn't practical. And then what he's also saying is, or they save that money and they don't reinvest it back into the economy. They just hoard it in their bank accounts. And so that money is taken out of supply and it's just sitting there doing nothing. It's not put into anything productive. And that is what he's going to get to. It also misinforms rich people's decisions and adversely affects their motivation to work, to save and to invest. invest. I contend that rich people don't consume or even if they do consume, it's a tiny fraction of their wealth. So they don't consume, definitely not as much as poor people. Poor, poor people consume 100 plus percent of their income every single month. Rich people don't. Rich people don't produce. A very tiny fraction of their wealth is tied down in manufacturing or services. Most of it is in assets. Assets such as T-bonds and T-bills and stocks and real estate. So non-productive assets. <laughs> so non-productive assets, they don't produce. And most importantly, it's a myth that rich people invest. Rich people do not invest. They do not invest in the productive economy. This is so important. I'm so glad he said this because it is such a misunderstanding of thinking that rich people invest their money. They don't invest in anything. <laughs> really, not really. They are not actually investing in innovation or anything that could be considered risky he's absolutely correct they're not really investing in anything certainly not in uh, productivity um or anything like that like you don't see them using their wealth to help bring other people out of like poverty right or you know investing in small businesses or something like that they don't do that they simply don't poor people do yeah, he's right. rich people have an inflationary mindset they prefer to spend their capital, but owing to the amounts involved, they are forced to hold on to the bulk of it. If you're Warren Buffett and you have 80, 90 billion, that's with a B, dollars, what on earth are you going to do with it? You're richer than most countries in the world. What are you going to do with 90 billion? Where can you invest it? There are no investment opportunities. There's not enough, there's not, there are not enough goods to consume with such an amount. So most of it lies dormant, lies dead. Most of it is tied down in assets, both tangible and financial. These people wish to consume an inflationary effect, but they end up saving, which has a deflationary effect. Yeah. They demonetize the economy. Rich people take money out of the economy. Yes. And put it in bank vaults and in non-productive assets. Yes. <laughs> Poorer people, the poor, have a deflationary state of mind. So remember, the, the rich have an inflationary state of mind, but can't use the money. Poor folks, they have an opposite, the opposite. They have a deflationary state of mind. 
they would like to hold on to their money. But they, but they are forced to spend most of it or even all of it. Yeah, there's poor people, middle class people have like no savings. They're literally living paycheck to paycheck. Not to mention avail themselves of additional credits and loans. Yes. Savings rate has been negative for many years. And even when it's positive, it's tiny, at least in the West. Yeah, that's absolutely correct. Poor people wish to uh, save a deflationary effect but they end up consuming and having an inflationary effect. And so all the economic players in the marketplace wind up acting irrationally against their innermost as well as expressed wishes and preferences. And this gulf between the desires and actions of all the economic agents is the main source of instability and uncertainty in the capitalist system. Yeah, I think that is absolutely correct. And I think that's why you can kind of look at things and say, that the system itself is broken, and I don't really know how it's how you can fix that. Based as it is on wealth transfer from the many to the few. Yes. And on the accumulation in, in the hands of the few of all the assets and wealth. Income inequality. The few own the bulk, the many own nothing. Correct. And that's a major, major problem. It did not used to be like that um, back in the day in America. It certainly wasn't. Uh, and then we had that started to go that way. We brought in antitrust laws to try to rein that in and prevent that from happening. But again, they're not enforced. And all of the politicians are these same people at the top, right, going along with this. They're, they're certainly not going to make it so that things have to be fairer. Why would they? They're the beneficiaries of the system as it currently exists. What are the effects of these discrepancies in the perception of money between the rich and the rest of us? How is this psychological gap, indeed abyss, how is it manifested in economic expectations and in one's grasp of one's purchasing power based on streams of future income? How does the price signal react to this yawning income inequality. And as, I'm, as I, I keep saying, it's not an, only an economic issue. It affects the psychology of the players. You see, the larger the disparities between rich and poor, the greater the share of national wealth held by the rich, the more deflationary the economy. Rich people consume only a tiny portion of their wealth. The rest is tucked away in the vaults of financial institutions, in real estate, in art. Yeah. The money of the rich is effectively taken out of circulation and its velocity drops precipitously. Yes. It has no effect on the economy. The rich bleed the economy dry. Following the pandemic, most of the money, most of the wealth, most of the assets will be held by the rich. And the economy will be dis exsanguinated, will be without blood. That's it. That's exactly what's happening. He was right. Here we are in 2022. We're seeing exactly what he said. We're seeing it happen, guys. And it's why we started this article with, uh, or we started this video with the article from the Epic Times saying something really strange is happening. You know, we're in a recession, but then there's things happening that shouldn't be happening that have aren't typical. And that's, that's what, what it is, is that we're in an unprecedented situation now. And it's, it's not going to get better. And that's why we looked at some of the other stuff that are calling this the post COVID uh, economy and that this is going to be a thing now. It's just going to be, you know, inflation is here to stay is what, basically what they were saying. Uh, and that now we're, we're in this unprecedented place. And that's, it's absolutely happening. He was totally correct. You have this dead economy. Um, you have, the problems with the supply chains, everything is crumbling and falling apart. And meanwhile, the people at the top continue to amass more and more and more, but they're doing nothing. They, they hoard that to themselves. They don't pour it back into the economy. So they're bleeding it dry, as he said. And I want to say for people who, um, you know, might criticize this as, oh, you know, uh, this is communist uh, to think this way. No, it's not. It's not communist and Marxist to point out that the system we have now that we call capitalism 
is broken and it is bad. It is not good for regular people. You know, I think a lot of conservatives, um, it, maybe not so much the younger ones, but older people who were traditionally conservative had this idea about the free market, right? And unfettered capitalism, that this was a good thing. And it's simply not. And that doesn't make you communist to say that, to point out the truth. And we have gone over this in other videos where we talked about these massive corporations pushing the green energy stuff, pushing sustainable development, pushing Agenda 2030, pushing diversity, equity, and inclusion quotas, pushing wokeness. Uh, that's coming from corporations, guys. All right? So uh, this idea of, like, corporate power and unchecked greed is, is a good thing. No, it's not. It's like severe car crash or injury. Admittedly, rich people's savings do serve as a source of investments, but only when the transmission mechanisms of the financial system are intact, which they are not going to be after the pandemic. And when trust right. is, reason is reasonably high, trust in the system, which is not going to be after the pandemic. He's right, and we, we can see that. Everybody knows there's something wrong. Nobody has any more trust, not only in the institutions and in our politicians, but in the financial system. There is no more trust in the dollar, and we actually see the world de-dollarizing. We've seen the rise of um, trading blocks like BRICS that are all designed to bypass the United States and um, trying to get rid of the the dollar is the world reserve currency. I just we just did a video with uh, Putin announcing at the 14th BRICS summit a new reserve currency. So yes, there is no more trust in the system. Everyone knows something's wrong. Everyone knows it's broken. And as he says, this is a major problem because it leads to more destabilization. When these two are missing, working banking system and trust in the system. You can forget about transmission from wealth to investment. Investment right. will dry up as well, starting with capital investment. He's right. In That's times what of we're crisis and now. recession, financial institutions tend to be rendered dysfunctional and trust abates. And he just said, entering a recession, this is what's going to happen. We are entering the recession and we're seeing it happen now. Redistribution via schemes of progressive taxation, they do am ameliorate some of the deflation deflationary effects of income inequality, but they can never counter it completely. No, and, and the stimulus checks and stuff like that, that leads to inflation. Holy. So if you look at conservative sociologists, they self-servingly marvel at the, at the peaceful proximity of abject poverty and ostentatious affluence in American or, for that matter, Western cities. They say, wow, look at that. There's a gated community surrounded by a slum, and these people live in peace. That's the main achievement of capitalism. Mm -hmm. Devastating riots do erupt, but these are reactions either to perceived social injustice, Los Angeles, 1965, or to political oppression, Paris, 1968. Yeah, exactly. Um, I'm going to move now to about the 33-minute mark here because I don't want to make this video too long, but I'm trying to give you guys a good overview of a long video because I do think there's a lot of really important stuff being discussed here. It's all accommodating, but also inexorable and all pervasive. This approach was at the heart of capitalism. The capitalist religion with its temples, shopping malls, banks, with its clergy, Bankers, financiers, bureaucrats, <laughs> and with its rituals, this religion was created by the new rich. It had multiple aims, to bestow some divine or historical importance and meaning upon processes which might have otherwise been perceived as selfish or chaotic or threatening, and to serve as an ideology in the Althusserian sense, hiding the discordant, the disagreeable, and the ugly, while accentuating the concordant, conformist, and appealing, the attractive. To provide a historical process framework, to prevent feelings of aimlessness and vacuity, to give life a meaning, to motivate its adherence, to perpetuate itself, these were the aims of the capitalist meta-ideology, philosophy. And I'm saying this were and was, I'm using the past tense, 
because something really, really bad has happened with capitalism. Yeah, he's right. And it's okay to criticize capitalism. It doesn't make you a communist or a Marxist to say, look, you know, this isn't working. <laughs> this is not turned out well. It is transitioning to what I call neo-feudalism. And he's right. I thought it's going to take 50 years. And in my interviews with Richard Grenon, that's what I said. But in one of these interviews, I actually said, unless there's a pandemic. Pandemics hasten processes. That's exactly what happened after the Black Death in Europe. The rise of laborers and wage earners started in Europe after the Black Death. So many people were left that they could bargain for their wages. The same is going to happen now. But let's continue before we, we discuss predictions for the future. Let, let's continue with a little, you know, with a philosophical foundation. Remember that the first type of the new rich were actually subversive. So he, this is an interesting point. He, he was talking about uh, the old money and then the, the new rich that came in and how they tried to create this sort of, you know, almost religion around capitalism to get everybody on board with it. And, to, and even though it in many ways went against their interests. The second type of the new rich, also known as nomenclature in certain regions of the world, they chose to violently and irreversibly uproot and then eradicate, kill the old elite. Exec yeah, yeah. Execute the old rich, right? Execute them sometimes. Yeah, that's absolutely what happened in um, Cambodia and other communist regimes. All right, we're going to move forward here again to about 40 minutes in. Available substitute. Social distancing broke us apart, atomized us. It atomized us much more than before. Yeah, we were already facing a problem of atomization, and then this made it worse. Everybody is working from home. People are social distancing. People are doing remote work uh, from Zoom. It's just insane. Prior to social distancing, about 11% of all households in the United States consisted of a single person following social distancing. The fear of each other. The, this fear will not go away with the virus. And I think we are headed towards totally atomized anomic society, to use Durkheim's term. And I think because of that, we will all reg regress. The future is infantile. We are we are traveling back back to the future. Our future is our past. We're all going to become children. And so that's already been underway for a long time. Look how dumbed down everybody is and how everybody has been infantilized and easily controlled. The um the pseudo religion of the social distancing and, and masking up and all this other stuff, that is a perfect expression of this infantilized, regressive, childlike state. Uh, as children, we are going to be cruel, insensitive, unable to delay the gratification of urges and desires. In That's many a really countries, good point. Um, children are the only capitalists to be found. I mean, childlike capitalists. There, these people spun off a malignant pathological form of chronic capitalism. As time passes, these immature new rich will become tomorrow's old rich, and a new class will emerge, the new rich of the future. And this is the only hope, however inadequate and meager, that the developing countries, for example, have to develop such a class. It's a sad, decrepit and frightening picture. It's a picture of people who can find happiness in nothing except abrogating their adult chores and responsibilities, <laughs> renouncing adult behaviors and traits, and becoming children again. We have seen this trend in the West long oh, before yeah. the pandemic. Yeah, he's absolutely, absolutely correct. I don't know if this is part of decadence or something like that, but just look at the video we played of a high school in the 1960s and just look at the American people today or Western people in general today. They are like gorged children, right? Children that cannot, the, the obesity problem, like you can't stop eating 
because you're like a child whose mom didn't tell you like that you you have to eat your vegetables at some point you can't just stuff your face with cake all day it is so oh god it's so sad and there will be a lot of manifest expressed envy institutionalized even i think for example the whole phenomenon of donald trump is institutionalized envy i thought that was a really interesting point that he makes of people who felt disenfranchised from the system and uh trump represented their their expression of that anger in a system that had locked them out and betrayed them um, and doesn't represent their interests. Now, moving on. Illusion. So furious, so fearful, so risk averse, so paranoid, so hateful, so conspiracy minded that they will regard anyone, anyone with excess profit, income, or rent as the enemy. Okay, he's talking about how because of this massive. A transfer of wealth that's happening you're gonna have people who are so disillusioned and they're so beaten down uh, that they're gonna be distrustful of anyone that has even a little bit of money they're gonna be envious of them they're gonna think everybody's greedy look at the we already see this with uh, AOC wearing a dress that says like tax the rich or eat the rich um, we're gonna see that same thing of calling landlords rich and stuff like that which is not true uh, but that mentality of anybody that has a little bit more than you, they don't deserve it. They're, we need to take it from them. They're bad. It is, yeah, envy is bad. It's a sin. And there's a reason for that. We are heading to a really, really bad place. To an undermining of the very foundation, philosophical and ideological foundation of capitalism, which was meritocracy. Mm -hmm. You work hard. You're clever. You have an idea. You're talented, you're skilled, you deserve excess compensation. In a theory of justice published... Yeah, we don't have meritocracy anymore. They've been getting rid of that for a long time and they've been picking and choosing winners. They've been giving people special privileges and saying, oh, you can't hire um, a straight white male. You've got to you know, meet these quotas. You have to uh, diversify. You have to do this and that. It is no longer based on merit. It is based on other things. And the people at the top get to decide. In 1971, John Rawls described an ideal society. And he described it this way. He said, number one, each person is to have an equal right to the most extensive, extensive total system of equal basic liberties compatible with a similar system of liberty for all. Number two, social and economic inequalities are to be arranged so that they are both A, to the greatest benefit of the least advantage, consistent with the just savings principle, and B, attached to offices and positions open to all under conditions of fair equality of opportunity. So, But they're pushing this equity stuff now, which is not the same as equality. They're not giving... Uh, a quality of opportunity based on merit. That's not what's happening anymore. Rawls' perception of a just society has, to, has a lot to do with scarcity of resources. It's because look, if resources are infinite, then there is no meaning to the word excess. I mean, never mind how much money I make, because resources are infinite. You can make the same or more if you wish. But if resources are scarce and limited, it's a zero-sum game. If I get something, you get nothing. The scarcity of resources, land, money, raw materials, manpower, creative brains, these are all scarce. Those who can afford to do so, they hoard resources yes. to offset anxiety regarding future uncertainty. And others wallow in paucity and poverty. The distribution of means is skewed. Distributive justice deals with the just allocation of scarce resources. I read to you Rawls's definition once again of a just society because it's really, really, really very crucial. It's in the theory of justice. A just society, an ideal society, is where one, each person is to have an equal right to the most extensive total system of equal basic liberties compatible with a similar system of liberty for all. 
Number two, social and economic inequalities are okay, are to be arranged, but they must conform to two conditions. Number one, that the greatest benefit, um, to the greatest benefit of the least advantage, consistent with the just savings principle. And number two, in other words, he says that the least advantage should be taken care of in such a system. And number two, these excess profits or rents or whatever, they should be attached to offices and positions which are open to all of them. Right, which is not the case anymore. Um, and we don't we don't see that happening anymore. We don't see the most vulnerable being taken care of. I mean, that was supposed to be the purpose of things like Social Security, Medicaid, Medicare. There's so much fraud with that, um, first of all, but also that it's just not sustainable. That's not going to last anymore because of the the declining uh, future um, and the young people's ability to continue to pay into that system and for that to be sustainable. It's simply not. Under conditions of fair equality of opportunity. So this is these are crucial. Uh, but you see, even the basic terminology is fuzzy. What constitutes a resource? And what is meant by allocation? Who should allocate resources? Adam Smith's invisible hand? Or maybe the government? Consumer? Business? One major revolution? Nothing short of revolution in the wake of this pandemic, yeah. is that governments took over the allocation of resources. Yeah, exactly. That's centralization of power. That is communism. It's Marxism. Now everyone has a guaranteed basic income from the government. Checks are arriving in the bank. Now governments stepped in and they are paying the salaries. They are paying salaries, wages in the, public, in the private sector. Now companies don't approach their shareholders for capital, they approach the public purse, they approach taxpayers. <laughs> the pandemic did in four weeks or four, or four months what Marx and all his minions failed to do in a century. America now is totally, a totally socialist country. I would even say Marxist, to some extent communist. Yes, communist. He's right. He's telling the truth. So let's go back to allocation. Should allocation reflect differences in power, in intelligence, in knowledge, in heredity? Should resource allocation be uh, subject to a principle of entitlement? Is it reasonable to demand that allocation be just or merely efficient? Or maybe justice and efficiency are antonyms? Yeah, I mean, he's he's making a good point here about, like, what, what do these words actually mean? They're fuzzy. Who decides, right? And this is communism. It is. He's absolutely correct. And then we're, we'll wrap it up here after this part. Person who is interested in swapping his books for my origins. So illiquid, small, or imperfect markets inhibit the scope of these exchanges. Additionally, exchange participants have to agree on an index. How many books for how many oranges? And this is the price of oranges in terms of books. And here, the post-pandemic world is going to implode. Yeah, and that's what's happening. We're currently watching it implode right now. We're watching all of this uh, post-World War II neoliberal legacy uh, systems. We're watching it all fail. We're watching everything implode. And uh, the question then is, is this by design is it on purpose to usher in the great reset right and bring in the neo-feudal age we've heard them continuously talk about public private partnerships more and more lately that is neo-feudalism guys it's going to implode because markets will be rendered illiquid small and imperfect yep. by risk aversion and by illiquidity generally in other words people will not have money to invest and so markets will become smaller and smaller and smaller, less and less liquid. Prices will not signal reality properly. They will be subject to manipulation, for example. Yes, that's happening right now. And sellers and buyers will find it difficult to match. There will be inefficiencies, as we call it. And money, the obvious index, does not solve this problem. It merely simplifies it and facilitates exchanges, but it does not eliminate the necessity to negotiate an exchange rate. It does not prevent market failures. In other words, money is not an index. 
It is merely a medium of exchange and a store of value. The index, as expressed in terms of money, is the underlying agreement regarding the values of resources in terms of other resources, the values of oranges in terms of books, the relative values. The market and the price mechanism increase happiness and welfare by allowing people to alter the composition of their bundles. The invisible hand is just and benevolent, but money is imperfect. The aforementioned roles demonstrated in 1971 that we need to combine money with other measures in order to place value on intangibles. <clears throat> and again, this is where we're going to have serious problems after the pandemic. The disruption is so enormous yep. that many, many transmission mechanisms have been disabled. And I find it difficult to believe that many of them will kind of spring back to action within days or months or even years. Yeah, here we are two years later. We're in 2022. And this is exactly what we're seeing. We just started this video by talking about the clogged ports, the supply chain problems that continue, even though a lot of the lockdowns have been lifted and stuff like that. They're not coming back the way that they were, absolutely as he predicted. They're not going to just spring back to normal functioning. No, that's not happening. And it's not just that. It's with everything else. People don't want to return to work. Uh, there's Everything is now basically broken. Oh, uh, the very foundational, uh, the very foundation and the superstructure, they both crumbled at the same time. Both supply and demand were disrupted. And also the meeting places between supply and demand and the ways to negotiate agreed prices for supply and demand. In other words, the signaling. The prevailing market theories postulate that everyone has the same resources at some initial point. They call it the starting gate. It is up to them to deploy these endowments and thus to ravage or increase their wealth. While the initial distribution is equal, the end distribution depends on how wisely or imprudently the inital distribution was used. Yes, exactly. Egalitarian thinkers proposed to equate everyone's income in each time frame, for example, every year. But Identical incomes do not automatically yield the same accrued wealth. Exactly. It depends on how you spend it and how smart you are with the resources that you have. Just because you start out with the same resources as someone else doesn't mean you're automatically going to end up in the same position as them. It depends on how you utilize it and how smartly you apply it. The latter depends on how the income is used. Is it saved? Is it invested? Is it squandered? Right. Relative disparities of wealth are bound to emerge regardless of the nature of income distribution. And that's another problem with the pandemic. We're emphasizing income. Yes. We are ignoring, conveniently, of course, and self-interestedly, the rich who control the political apparatus and mechanism. Yes. Uh, the rich ignore the issue of wealth. They ignore the issue of capital. They ignore the issue of savings or lack thereof. They ignore investments. They focus the public's attention on two relatively irrelevant issues, yes. income and products consumption. Yes. Some say that excess wealth should be confiscated and redistributed. Progressive taxation and the welfare state, welfare state aim to secure this redistribution. Redistributive mechanisms reset the wealth clock periodically at the end of every month, for example, or every fiscal year. In many countries, the law dictates which portion of one's income must be saved, and by implication, how much can be consumed. This conflicts with basic rights, like the freedom to make economic choices. Yeah. The legalized expropriation of income is known as taxes. It's morally dubious. Anti-tax movements have sprung all over the world, and their philosophy permeates the ideology of political parties in many countries, not least the United States. Taxes are punitive. They penalize enterprise. They penalize yes. success, entrepreneurship, foresight, and risk assumption. Welfare, on the other hand, rewards dependence up to the point of parasitism. Yes, parasitism and dependence, exactly. Hello. <laughs> According to Rawls' difference principle, all tenets of justice are either redistributed, redistributive or retributive. This ignores non-economic activities and human inherent variants, of course. Moreover, conflict and inequality are the engines of growth and innovation, which mostly benefit the least advantaged in the long run. Experience shows that unmitigated equality results in atrophy, corruption, and stagnation. 
Exactly. Equity. Thermodynamics teaches us that life and motion are engendered by an irregular distribution of en energy, by a gradient. Entropy, an even distribution of energy, equals death. Exactly. That's true. That's why communism is a death cult. At the end of the day, that's so true. And if you understand, like, basic physics, like, you could grasp that. But it's the magical thinking of, like, if I simply throw money at people and we just even the playing field then magically everyone's going to be equal people are not equal they're not born equal i am not good at running or something like that and i never will be but somebody else is you know there are innate born differences between people not everybody is created equally so you cannot force equal like this sort of equality of outcomes it does lead to death that's the only thing in which we are all equal so it can only lead to de death that is why is the death called it's why it always leads to mass executions that is the only thing in which we can all be truly equal is that we're all gonna die in studies in economics as well so what about the disadvantage and the challenge 95 percent, 99 percent of the population what about uh, extreme cases of disadvantage, like mental retardation, mental mental insanity. Well, they're going to start executing those people as well. Um, anyways, I, I'm going to probably wrap it up here. I think that it, this has been long enough, but I think that you guys get the idea of, of what he was saying back in 2020. And I think that a lot of what he said is has not only come to pass, but will come to pass in the future. And I see that as being the trajectory that our elites have put us on. Um, it, to me, makes a lot of sense. And we're already on our way there. So anyways, let me know what you guys thought of this video. Do you agree? Do you disagree? Uh, let me know in the comments section below. And I hope that you all have a really good day. Um, if you would, consider liking, subscribing, and leaving a comment. You know, that always helps. And I love hearing from you guys. And I like hearing your opinion. I hope everybody has a good day. Whee!